Great. So everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for staying. Uh, this talks about uh, application security made DevOps. I'm, my name is Boris Chen. I work at a startup uh, called T-Cell. We're based here in the city. Uh, we do application security at runtime. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the product details. I'm going to talk uh, more generally about how security, uh, and in particular apps, application security, plays into DevOps and how DevOps is essential for uh, strong application security. So um, why application security? Well, the first thing is that web app attacks are actually the top breach pattern. Uh, that's according to Verizon's uh, 2016 DBIR. And uh, every company now is uh, an IT company of some sort. Uh, it's a software eating the, pro uh, software eating the world concept. Uh, and so, as people know here, DevOps in particular has enabled uh, higher quality, faster innovation in applications. Before, we were always making the trade-off between uh, stability and innovation, and DevOps has helped, been a key factor in breaking that deadlock and in order for us to accelerate how we innovate and how we deliver. Um, that everyone knows here. But one thing I want to point out is how DevOps uh, plays with application security. There's a developing trend. Some people might have heard of uh, DevSecOps or SecDevOps, one or the other. Um, but uh, that's what I'm going to dive into. Uh, so the key thing here is that uh, to start off, the security starts at the beginning. A lot of times people think of, OK, well, I'll just develop my thing, and then I'll buy something and make it secure. Well, that, that never works, as anyone who's tried it um, has uh, experienced. And so let's sort of take a, our step, step back just a little bit about uh, DevOps uh, three principles. A lot of people have seen this. This is uh, from, from uh, Gene Kim's uh, DevOps handbook, uh, but there's other things that this diagram has uh, come out in. But uh, the three principles are basically flow, you know, how you go from beginning to end. How do you automate that? How do you uh, make that as fast as possible? The feedback, the fast iterations, right? Everything should be highly iterative. And then the continuous learning. At every stage, with integrated teams, integrated process, integrated tools, you can, uh, your teams learn, have a shared responsibility, and it accelerates the innovation the, the op in operations, but also, in this context, security. So why is uh, the first concept so key? So, it's really important to get from beginning to end as soon as possible. And in order to do that, uh, again, you have to start at the beginning uh, with security. So security from the ground up. Is, is the team integrated into the design process? Are your security engineers part of the design, the architecture? Uh, are they part of the scrum? Uh, do they use the same tool sets? Oftentimes I see people, you know, we have our security issues here, we have our dev issues there. You'll never be able to uh, communicate uh, effectively uh, with that setup. And, and that's how you, you, you distribute that shared responsibility across the team. Uh, are, your, are your things automated? If you do code analysis, are they automated just like you do um, your automated tests? Uh, do you uh, incorporate security into your code reviews? But most importantly, the reason why you want to finish fast is what happens when you deploy. When you deploy is when you actually see uh, your product in action. You get the user feedback. You get to see how it, how it functions under real load. In the same way, you get to see how your security assumptions, designs, uh, all hold up in the real world environment. Uh, so I'm going to uh, illustrate this a little bit, why this is the case uh, in the DevOps model and why DevOps helps uh, accelerate an order of magnitude over traditional waterfall. And this is something that LAP, many of you may have seen before if you've been to uh, lots of DevOps talks. But I'll just review this quickly, just for those who haven't seen it. But there's an illustration of mailing letters. So you have four stages of mailing letters. You have uh, folding the paper, you have putting it in the envelopes, you have sealing the envelopes, and you have stamping the envelopes. So the question is, do you do each thing as a batch? Do you fold all the paper, take all the paper, then fold, put them in all the envelopes, et cetera? That, uh, or do you do, you do uh, uh, many batches of one. So you take one sheet of paper, put that in a vote, seal it, and stamp it, and then repeat. Right? So the questions put forth, you know, which one is the most efficient? The in, sort of instinctive, at least for me, is like the big batch seems like it's most efficient, because you can sort of assembly line it. 
Um, but uh, in reality, you come up with some problems. Uh, and this is an ad analogous to the waterfall versus uh, um, uh, agile approaches. And the reason uh, can be sort of seen by this chart. So at the top, you have the big batch, where you fold, say, four pieces of paper, uh, one, two, three, four. Then you uh, seal. Then you uh, stamp, or well, you, you seal and stamp. So the first time you get the first available batch to see a complete product, a complete thing ready to mail, is way at the end, the first available, after you've gone through that process. Whereas in a small batch, the first time you see it is after the first four steps. And so you have a delay in the first product available. Why is this so important? Well, think about what happens if your paper uh, doesn't fit correctly, right? You only figure that out at the last thing. And then you have to redo the batches ahead of time, and that, uh, or the batches that you've already done, right? You basically have to toss out the material. And this happens in, in software engineering projects all the time, where you do late integration, and then you realize, oh, an assumption that we did during design didn't hold true, and so we have to sort of rework something. And so the fast uh, process to first available is what uh, de-risks that. Well, the same concept happens with security, is that, um, that getting to the first available is the first time you actually see things in production, and you get to see all the things that happened prior to that uh, live. And so um, let's review a little bit about why, um, why, this is, uh, uh, why this is the case of the first batch or the small batch helps, is that uh, you have a high amount of work in progress with the large batches. You have a high cost of mistakes uh, with large batches. Uh, and then you don't have the iterative improvement, which is key for the product. And then in the end, you sort of think, I thought, well, you might have all those things, but what about the end result, the time to beginning to end? That surely is shorter with the big batches, because batching in general seems to, to help with that. But they've actually shown, had studies shown that actually small batches uh, end up being faster on the whole, which is very interesting, but also explainable if you think about uh, the, 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 the muscle memory that you do in order to do the fold, all, all the steps in the process. And that's what you want to do with security. You want to have that integrated in the whole thing, not at the end, because if you don't, if you, if you don't have that fast path, right, um, you're, you're going to uh, uh, have to revisit a lot of assumptions that you had prior. And so the key thing is that you want to get to real data as soon as possible. Uh, the sooner you get uh, something live is the sooner that you can ver verify uh, what you've assumed. And uh, that's when you get security for real, right? Everything's uh, before that is theoretical. Oh, you did a pen test. OK, great. Uh, you did a, a code review. OK, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, those things are all good things to do. But until something's live, then uh, then you don't have the actual data. Uh, and so I want to introduce uh, security starting at the end. So I just talked about you need security from the beginning, but actually uh, you also need it at the end. And what do I mean by that is the feedback loop. Because when you get to the end, what do you do with that? Well, you want to take that information that you've learned and then fold that into the beginning part. And having those fast iterations is, ha is how DevOps is successful, and that, that's the same case uh, with security. Um, when you have uh, data, live data um, in production, you can look at what attackers are doing on your site. Not only attackers, but also real users, but uh, primarily, since this is a security talk, talking about attackers. When, we, when you have those attack patterns, uh, that helps you, informs how you prioritize your work. Because right? we always have this uh, issue of having many things to do, a uh, little time to do it. And so the key things for that is priorities. And how you, how you want to drive priorities is not through uh, theoretical things. You want to do it by hard data. It allows you to uh, uh, reinspect your assumptions about how things are to perform in production. And also, more importantly, is that it shows any oversights that you've had. Because you will have oversights, right? You might use the right frameworks. You might have the right process. You might have the right tools. But something falls uh, between the cracks. and and uh, having that visibility in production helps that. And then that can fold back into the beginning, and that, uh, that provides that very fast cycle time. And why do you want to have that fast cycle time is, um, is basically that uh, whenever you have the remediation, uh, you can address those 
uh, very quickly. And, uh, and that also plays into how attackers attack the pro the pro the, your system as well, right? So uh, what I mean by that is that when you have fast iterations, uh, your, the target that the attackers are going against is actually always moving. So if you imagine that you deploy every six months, then you have a very static target for those six months. The recon that they did five months ago on your site still applies uh, the next month, the, next, the month after, and the month after that. So the shelf life of that information is very long standing. When you get your deployment down to one month, then the shelf life is one month, and then down to one week, one day, one hour, right? So the more that you have this faster feedback, is the, 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 the more dynamic your, your, your target is, and that, makes it, that increases the, the attack um, cost of the attacker. And that's one of the key things that you always want to do is for anything that you have is increasing the, the, t uh, the, the cost uh, for attacking. And then the final thing I want to cover is continuous learning. So I talked about this a little bit, but um, when you have the real-time data in production, you can use that for every stage of the process, whether it's uh, development, testing, et cetera. Um, that helps you basically develop the DevOps culture of security being everybody's job, the shared responsibility that comes with that. As a security person, you have the same, uh, security people have the same dilemma that ops people have, right? That there's many more developers than ops people, there's many more uh, 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 developers than security people. And so having security uh, um, uh, being a shared responsibility allows the, company, the, the team to scale, but in order to scale, you need that data, and, uh, and, the, and having that common uh, pane of glass allows you to have those uh, uh, teachable moments that informs every stage of the process. It helps you evaluate your designs, helps evaluate the tool chain that you've chosen, uh, it evaluates your process, it informs your code reviews, and also informs your postmortems. We're a very, uh, 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 it's a very common practice to have ops and dev in postmortems, and security is, is a key component of that. Um, so this, uh, I put together this checklist as a as a, as a quick overview of things that you are essential if you want a, 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 a good application security uh, program for, for DevOps. Um, there's, a, there's several categories of tools that you want. So one is static analysis. Oftentimes people use this to find bugs, but there's also uh, lots of use cases that you find things via static analysis for, for, uh, for, te for security. Uh, dynamic analysis, there's things uh, like uh, OWASP's uh, Zap tool. Um, there's other uh, things like Burp, et cetera. Those provide uh, dynamic analysis. There's a, a dependency scanning. What are the things you, you are incorporating into your applications that could provide or could introduce risks that maybe you don't happen to see in testing, but there's a known vulnerability from this package you're using. You better know that ahead of time before you build everything around it. Um, source code integrity and code signing. So oftentimes you say, okay, I have everything in Git and I just deployed it, but what happens if, how do you know that what you've actually deployed, oops, sorry, is um, what you're actually, or what you've actually developed is what you actually deployed, right? So uh, source code integrity and signing help prevent uh, that type of tampering that can introduce backdoors. Uh, developer training and standards, again, if it's a shared uh, process, a shared responsibility, you want, and you want it from the beginning, then, then everybody has to be brought into the fold. Uh, you might want to have cloud security. Everyone moves to the cloud. It's the same thing as host and network security. Uh, you want uh, that to, as well. But the key thing I want to also uh, bring out, as you see in each of the slides I showed, is a key component for application security is a runtime security monitoring and also protection uh, of your application. Uh, why is that? Well, as I mentioned before, is that you can go through the whole dev process and say, I've used the right frameworks for for, uh, let's, let's take the example of performance. I use the right uh, uh, scalable infrastructure uh, uh, tools to, to develop my application. I have uh, you know, auto-scaling groups, I have good, powerful machines to handle a load, and it went through performance testing. If you have all those things, do you need to do monitoring and production? Right? No one ever says, oh, you've done all those things? The ops person says, oh, sure, then I don't need to use Datadog or New Relic or anything to monitor my life site, right? No one ever says that. So 
it's funny how uh, we forget that for security. Uh, when, we f when we first started T-Cell, the interesting thing about it is that it was surprising the number of people we talked to says, well, we already have uh, strong uh, uh, secure frameworks that we use. We already do static checking. We already do test and quarterly pen tests. So there's no reason to have a security tool in production. Um, that, that, that I thought, uh, thought was quite stunning. Uh, but the real reality is you, you do need, because the things do fall through the cracks. Uh, you want to uh, uh, account for that, because if you, if, you, if you count on things not falling through the cracks, it's, it's basically Murphy's Law. And the, th the other thing that you want to do is make sure that it's real time. Uh, just like you want to know as soon as possible when something is broken in your site, you want to know when an attack is successful uh, on your site as soon as possible as well. Um, you know that uh, uh, things will fall through the cracks, as I mentioned. And the last thing is uh, to keep in mind is virtual patching. So when things fall through the cracks, when things are discovered and exploited by somebody, even if you have a fast cycle time, right, even if you, you, can, you can test within five minutes and everything like that, someone has to still fix it. Uh, right, so that, that lag time still makes your live site exposed because you can't just shut down your site um, while, while there's a vulnerability existing. So virtual patching is a way in order to block attacks at runtime, which a lot of vendors, uh, including TSL, provide. And that gives you basically air cover while your dev team is able to remediate and then your ops team can push out a patch, uh, whether it's uh, you know, uh, an hour or, or a day, you still need that time uh, while, that, while that vulnerability is available. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I covered the three areas um, of the three principles of uh, DevOps, the flow, feedback, and learning, and how security is, um, can be integrated in each of those concepts. And, but the key takeaway here is to know that in order for this all to be successful, you want to get to the end. Right? You want to get live data at the end, and once you have that data at the end, that informs every stage of the process in which you can iterate uh, for faster deployments, and also you can level up the team by continuous learning where you can use that data to, to, uh, to improve the security posture every step of the way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Any questions?